Post Sonderfeld was completed in 1933, and what you see here is a careful reconstruction of what it looked like then, including the soft furnishings, furniture and fixtures. It's one of the best surviving examples of the architectural style known as Neuer Bowen, or Dutch functionalism. The architect was Leon van der Vlucht, of the firm Brinkmann and van der Vlucht. He created an ultra-modern, luxurious home made precisely to the owner's specifications. Welcome to House Sonnefeld. As a guest of the house, please feel free to go anywhere you like and look through all the doors. In the past, guests would be admitted into the hall by a servant. The living quarters are upstairs on the first floor. But before you go upstairs, we recommend that you have a look at the studio, here on the ground floor through the glass door. This studio, as it was known, was intended for the two daughters of the Sonnefeld family. The elder one was Magda, nicknamed Puck, who was 19 when the family moved into the house in 1933. Chesina, usually known as Hie for short, was seven years younger. Puck and Hie used the studio for reading, listening to music and receiving their friends. It's the only room in the house with parquet on the floor, probably so that it could be used for dancing when the daughters had parties here. We suggest that you now go up the main staircase to the living quarters on the first floor. This huge area actually consists of three rooms, the living room, the library and the dining room, which can be separated from each other using a partition and a curtain. When Mr. and Mrs. Sonnefeld moved here, they left all their old furniture behind and bought everything new to match the architect-designed interior. One acquaintance of the family says that they weren't even allowed to keep any Persian rugs. Instead, they chose tubular steel furniture because it was modern, light and open. You can also see some of the old furniture, such as the bureau in front of the window where Mrs. Sonnefeld wrote her letters and the Steinway grand piano, played by her elder daughter, Puck, who was very musical. This is where the Sonnefeld family and their guests ate their meals. They sat round the Huspen dining table, the one you see here is the original, and were served by one of the maids dressed in a smart white apron. If they needed anything, they could call her by pressing one of the buttons underneath each corner of the table. This is the room where food prepared in the kitchen was served through the serving hatch by one of the maids. The servants had to be up at 7.30 in the morning to get the breakfast ready and put the stove on. Life was one long cycle of washing and scrubbing, preparing tea, coffee and meals, and then clearing up afterwards. The library contains Mr. Sonnefeld's bureau, a fitted bookcase, and a small seat by the fireplace. The wall behind the fireplace is home to a number of ultra-modern gadgets. There's a clock connected to the electricity mains. Most of the rooms have these. This system was quite unusual for the time. Another novelty was the lighting in the library and sitting room, consisting of no fewer than 22 narrow strip lights on the ceiling. Herr Zeno Sonneveld Boss was born in 1886. Thanks to her husband's meteoric career, she had moved several rungs higher on the social ladder 
and spent most of her days looking after the house and reading. She received few visitors apart from a female friend who regularly came to tea. Mrs. Sonneveld had a big weakness for luxuries and status symbols. Whenever she went out, she'd wear a couple of items of jewelry, a long coat, usually fur trimmed, and a hat with a hat pin. But she was primarily a practical woman who liked everything to be neat and tidy and hated wasting time and money. She must have loved this revolutionary interior because as well as being luxurious, it was practical and efficient. Imagine what the view would have been like from here towards the River Maas. Nowadays, the Dirk Zicht Hospital is in the way. But in the early 1930s, there was a panoramic view. The Boyman's Van Berningen Museum was being built, along with a park full of villas for wealthy local people. But apart from that, it was all open space. During the Second World War, people took refuge here from the bombing, and Mrs. Sonnefeld reputedly took them cups of coffee. Rotterdam might have been in ruins, but Mrs. Sonnefeld got every one of her cups back unscathed. Bertus Sonneveld was 14 when he joined the Van Nella Coffee, Tea and Tobacco Factory as its youngest employee in 1900. His ascent through the company was a rapid one. In 1919, he became deputy manager, and in 1935, he was appointed business director of the tobacco division, where he remained until he retired in 1950. As a self-made businessman, he was greatly respected at Van Nella, but he was not authoritarian and got on well with people from all walks of life. Sonneveld had a huge admiration for the United States, where he often went to buy tobacco. He used a lot of English words and had American tastes when it came to music and cars. His travel to the United States also gave him a taste for modern comforts, mainly as a result of staying in large hotels and on luxury liners. He loved clever inventions and gadgets, and his affinity for the Niwabauen movement was probably because it combined comfort, efficiency, and advanced technology. Niwabauen was an architectural movement that mainly took place in the 1920s and 1930s. Its architects believed that the design of a building should be based on its function, and traditional forms, ornamentation and monumentality were out. For this reason, Neuerbauen was also known as New Realism or Functionalism. The functionalists were convinced that modern architecture was better than the traditional variety in a number of respects, technically, ideologically, hygienically and aesthetically. There are a lot of references to ship's architecture in House Sonnefeld. The architect, Leon Vanteflucht, was fascinated by the idea of combining unique works of craftsmanship with the industrial look. Like many of the newer Bowen architects, he was greatly influenced by the work of the French architect Le Corbusier. Puck, whose proper name was Magdalena, was born on July the 5th, 1913. She'd gone to a girls' school in Rotterdam, and then instead of going to the conservatoire, she trained as a secretary. In the summer of 1935, Puck went to America for a year. She stayed with acquaintances of her father. Dozens of events were organized in her honor. Lunches, tea, picnics, dinner parties. Shortly after she arrived, 175 guests assembled on the roof terrace of the Ritz Hotel for a lunch in honor of this attractive brunette from Rotterdam. Kie, her real name was Hyacina, was born seven and a half years after Puck. Friends from the time recall how she was sometimes collected in the car by her mother, the only mother in Rotterdam to have her own car. She married a businessman, 
Lane at Coy, and the couple had a son, Leonard, in 1948. His father died when he was one, and Leo was brought up by his grandparents. <laughs> Puck slept in the blue bedroom and He in the yellow one. He's room was slightly smaller than Puck's, but it still had every modern convenience, including its own internal phone extension, a dressing table mirror, a connection to the central sound system, access to a balcony, and a reasonable amount of cupboard space. This is the spacious bedroom of Albertus and Chiesina Sonnefeld, with a balcony on two sides. The colors in this room are distinctly unusual. Not many people these days would choose metallic brown walls and window frames in combination with silver doorposts and a gray floor covering. But the bronze-like brown is a deliberate choice. In the color scheme developed for the house by the architect, brown was the color of the rooms used by the couple. Red, on the other hand, was for the staff. The grey floor covering wasn't the architect's first choice. He originally proposed linoleum, but then agreed to the more luxurious and comfortable wool carpet. This striking green room was the dressing room of Mr. and Mrs. Sonnefeld. It's very cleverly designed. One side was for her and one for him. Here again, the emphasis is on practicality, which is why a little light goes on when the door opens, like a refrigerator. This was the Sonnefeld family's guest bedroom, though they probably didn't have very many guests. There are no fewer than 12 telephones in her Sonneveld, two outside ones and 10 house phones. In the 1930s, a telephone line was quite expensive. It cost nearly 100 guilders a year just for the line rental. But to the Sonnevelds, a telephone was an essential part of modern life, so the house was connected from the very outset. The kitchen was the maid's domain. They spent most of their time here, cooking, washing up, and doing other household chores. Mrs. Sonnefeld ran the household with a firm hand. She made the tea herself and browned the meat. There was a cult of tidiness in the house. Everything was put away as soon as it had been used, and the chrome always had to be gleaming. This separate staircase kept the family's living quarters strictly separated from those of the staff to ensure the maximum of privacy for the family. This separation was a great luxury, but there was also something old-fashioned and 19th century about it. Staff were a necessity, but they should be seen and not heard. The maids had their own bedrooms and a shared bathroom, much as the daughters of the family did. The bathroom has a separate wash basin for each maid, a substantial bath and a heated towel rail. Mr. Sonnefeld believed that everyone who lived in the house should have the same comforts, and the luxury afforded to the staff was the talk of Rotterdam. After tea in the evening, the maids could go to their rooms and listen to the radio or write letters, though they didn't have outside telephones. When they had time off, on Wednesday evenings and alternate Sundays, they had to be in by 10 o'clock. One of them, Jeanne Schruder, said that when her boyfriend brought her home on his bicycle, Mrs. Sonnefeld would watch from behind the living room curtains to make sure she was on time. She was a strict and demanding employer, but Jeanne Schruder described Mr. Sonnefeld as a darling.